Okay. Um, Robert Yang is an artist, writer, and game developer, at least according to Robert Yang's website. Uh, however, I can say one other thing about Robert, and that is that he was my thesis student, uh, and I, I beam with pride and joy um, about that. Robert, I forget what year that was. When did you graduate from the MFADT program? Oh, oh God. Uh, okay, you don't like have a, to remember. A I'll, million I'll look it up. years ago. Oh, man. <laughs> It was maybe in the last, you know, not in the 2020s for sure. Uh, it was definitely before then. Um, Robert's work has been, in, you know, exhibited widely, uh, has been played uh, in homes uh, around the world um, uh, and makes incredible and uh, provocative and political and uh, beautiful games about gay culture. Uh, and queerness um, from rinse and repeat, a uh, homoerotic uh, shower sim, one of my favorites, to hard lads, which is a meditation on a meme that questions uh, masculinity um, and all kinds of other performances. Um, Robert, you're one of my favorite, favorite, favorite game designers. Even if you weren't a former student of mine, I would be saying that. And I'm, we're just thrilled to have you here. I feel like you barely need more introduction um, and we'll get into some questions and stuff after uh, you talk a little bit about your work, but please thank you and welcome and thank you for joining us today all the way from New Zealand to share your practice. It's all yours. Oh, wow, yeah. Thanks for that introduction, Colleen. Um, okay, I mean, I try to zoom as little as possible, so I need to like, I have my boomer mode on. Okay, I think it's working. Um, do I wanna share sound? No, I'll just not share sound. I think I don't have that many videos. Um, that's, um, okay. I think I'm ready. Do, do do people like see the screen and all that? See my slides? Okay, it cool. Looks great. I see the content warning too. Uh, yes, there's multiple layers of content warning. So um, yeah, uh, hi, my name's Robert. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, my art practice and the games I make. And uh, this is called A Short Introduction to Video Game Sex. Uh, one content warning is that there is uh, sex and nudity involved. Uh, to be more specific, I would say this is like a soft R where, you know, it's not really explicit or anything. Um, you know, it'll be, it'll be some soft core CG nudity maybe, and it'll be kind of gay. Um, and there might be like a penis or two, but I think it'll be okay, hopefully. Uh, so let me get started. So in this talk, first uh, I'll talk a bit about my games. And uh, then I wanna talk about sex as play in general and think about the intersection between sex and games in a like more like theory designing kind of way. Uh, and then I wanna talk about the uh, like very real like material political stakes for me and that's when we start thinking about how sex intersects with technology and uh, platform capitalism. Uh, so first I'll start talking about my games a little bit. Um, this is one of the first gay games I made. Uh, this is called Hurt Me Plenty. Uh, it's a spanking game where you like spank a guy, but you also kind of have to negotiate with him a little bit about how he wants to be spanked. You know, does he want to be spanked, you know, just like a little bit with like a feather or does he want like a baseball bat on his ass, you know? So you kind of have to like talk to him a little bit, tease out what both of you want out of this. Um, and then you play out the scene. And then afterwards you also have to like 
um, listen to his feedback and, you know, he might say, oh, you went too hard on me or no, you didn't go hard enough. So it's a little bit of like a primer to like uh, BDSM and kink culture, uh, which believes heavily in like consent and negotiation and aftercare. And I found that like kind of like inspiring as like a game design like document almost. Um, oh, by the way, uh, feel free to like ask questions in the chat, I have the chat thing open. So, um, or I can like pause for questions at every section break too. Um, another game I made after that was uh, Succulent. Uh, this is this is kind of more like a music video type of game um, with uh, music by Arca. Are, are people familiar with Arca? Arca is like a really great musician. Um, well, what's cool is that Arca was actually just like a student at NYU and we like collaborated with them on our thesis and they gave us some music and sound design. It was really cool. Um, that's one really cool thing about living in New York. Like you'll meet like the next like big thing and hang out with them. And then like 10 years later, you'll like ask them for money or so. No, I don't ask anyone for money. That'd be weird. Um, but Succulent is like a game that is, is a lot simpler mechanically, you know, it's just a guy with a, like a popsicle and then, or a corn dog or, you know, whatever you think it is. And then you just watch it, you help him eat the thing. And, um, it's, it's pretty short and fast. Um, Stick Shift is an auto erotic driving simulator game where you get, you basically just give your car a hand job. Um, but you also learn how to like drive a manual transmission, kind of, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and it was also inspired by this Andy Warhol piece uh, called Blowjob, where like you kind of just see this guy from the waist up. Um, so in this, you kind of just see the driver from the waist up. But, you know, you can imagine all the things you can do with a car from the waist down. And um, there's a lot going on there. Um, then there's another game called uh, Cobra Club. Cobra Club is like a is like if if you've played like a 3D RPG where you like you design your own character. I wanted to make one of those, but for like a penis. So it's like a it's like you like you have all these sliders to like tune like like how big your dick is or like how big the balls are or like pubes or pubes and everything. You know, a lot of different settings you can configure and you can apply like Instagram filters and stuff. Um, it's like a dick pic photo studio game. Um, this one I actually have to fix up. It's kind of annoying. Uh, There's this mechanic where um, this is around when the US was renewing the Patriot Act, which is the American government legislation that lets them officially spy on all your internet communication um, officially. So uh, I made this one as like kind of a commentary on that where your dick pics get leaked to this like government database that's like siphoning up all the dick pics, it turns out in the story. Um, and then the game was like, it secretly was uploading all the dick pics you made to Tumblr. Um, the US government uses Tumblr for some reason. Um, and then after Tumblr, and then there was like a mil, there was like, I think like 300,000 dick pics on that Tumblr. And then um, Tumblr kind of shut down and like put the ban hammer on all like nudity and sexuality. So then I switched to Twitter, um, but now Twitter's kind of going down its own shithole now. So now it's just, I think I'm gonna rip out all the internet stuff and redesign the game. I don't know, still trying to figure it out. Uh, and then this is another game called Rinse and Repeat. Uh, Rinse and Repeat is where there's like a hunky guy in the shower, in the gym, and sometimes he needs help scrubbing up and cleaning up after, after his like Zumba class or something. So uh, you scrub him up and you wash his back, but he never washes yours. So it's kind of this interesting like one-sided parasocial relationship thing you have going. Um, and it doesn't really have a happy ending, but it's still a bittersweet romance. 
Uh, and then this is another game I made called The Tea Room. Uh, this is a bathroom sex game where you cruise for sex uh, with uh, for, for between men at a public bathroom, but it's also kind of historical. It's based on a real life uh, like bathroom sting that the police did in Ohio in 1962, uh, where they literally put like a surveillance camera in the bathroom to like record people having sex because the because the police had this problem where they wanted to put people in jail for having sex, but there wasn't like evidence like the people having sex in the bathroom aren't going to turn themselves into the police. Um, and you wouldn't have sex when there's witnesses in the bathroom, right? That kind of kills the vibe. So the police were like, hmm, what can we do? I know, let's install a secret camera, record all these men having sex. And they were making basically like one of the first color film gay porns secretly, really. Um, and so it's, it's kind of based on that where you're having, you know, it, it, it's kind of like a horror game a little bit where you're you're having sex with other guys in the bathroom, but you're also not sure if there's like a cop waiting to like try to catch you or something. Um, so there's like also a lot of tension involved with this game as well. Um, and then this is a hard lead. I think this game is kind of my masterpiece. I think this is probably my favorite thing that I made. Uh, Hard Lads is based on this uh, meme video uh, called, oh, hey, Flynn, what's up? Um, called uh, British Lads Hit Each Other with a Chair. And if you haven't seen it, I probably should have just put it in this presentation. You probably should have just watched it for a minute. Um, it's one of the most beautiful, like, videos, like, ever. Like, oh, my God, it's, it's gorgeous. But, um, like, so much happens. It's one of the watch it, like look it up. Um, but um, this game kind of like recreates that, but it's also trying to think through like the performance of like what it's like to record that happening in front of you, um, where like these two hunky guys hit each other with a chair. Um, and um, I think it does some interesting things with like video and like things through like art and masculinity as well. Um, I won't talk your head off about it, but you know, look it up if you're interested. And then uh, this is uh, one of my more recent games. Uh, this is We Dwell in Possibility. Uh, this is a collaboration I did with an uh, illustrator uh, named Eleanor Davis. Uh, she's like a fantastic illustrator. It was it was really great to collaborate with her because like. Cause like, it was nice to make something beautiful. <laughs> I'm always trying to make something kind of like gross or scary or like weird or like sinister or something. Um, but this was just like lush and gorgeous. Um, and I mean, not to get into like advice mode, but like artist career wise, I liked doing this cause it kind of forced me out of my comfort zone instead of making like a very video gamey 3D thing. I kind of had to like change up what the kinds of stuff I usually do, my usual approach to things. Um, and it helped me kind of like expand my range. Um, and this is like a 2D web game. Most of my stuff is not in a browser and it's usually 3D. So it also kind of made me change my format and technology and my tools. Um, but oh, I should talk about the actual game too. Uh, so this is a game where it's like a crowd, it's like a gay gardening crowd simulation thing where all these uh, naked cartoon people are running through this like public space um, and they're trying to decide what to do with this public space. So some of them bring in tents, some of them bring in like plants, some of them bring in like porn, um, some of them bring in flowers, and then some of them bring in police um, because people will not agree about what they want to happen in society. Uh, so it's kind of like this very, it's, it's kind of an overt metaphor, like some of the people in this game are like wearing little Union Jack hats or little MAGA hats, you know, like it's, it's, um, it, 
it, it was designed for like public exhibition. It was a commission for a festival. So I wanted it to be like very readable for people to make that connection between politics and sexuality like very readily. Um, so that's just, that's an overview of a bunch of my games. Um, any, any burning questions? Any quick questions or thoughts? Feel free to ask in the chat or unmute yourself I just, or something. Robert, I had a, I had a thought. Those, the 300,000 dick pic collection could be used as a machine learning data set. Oh, yeah. I mean, I already have a machine that can generate it, though. It's the problem. Like, <laughs> like a neural right. network. Sorry. Sorry. It, it, is, it is cool to think of training like a little cybernetic brain that's just completely depraved and perverted. Um, <laughs> or very wholesome, right? And they're very wholesome dick pics. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Good idea, though. <laughs> think about it. I do want to make like an AI themed kind of game at some point. So I'll, I'll keep that in my brain box. Uh, any other like questions or thoughts or burning ideas? Um, oh, in the chat, uh, Kayla asks, uh, how do you consider or uh, the concern about the opposite side of players when you built these games. Kayla, can you be a little bit more specific? I'm I'm not super sure what the opposite side of players means. Um, I, I mean, I don't know, I can riff while you type up a response. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, like those, okay. Um, oh, like opposing, like politics, right? Okay. Um, the, the unsatisfying answer to that is that um, a lot of homophobes actually play my games and they use my video games to like perform homophobia. Like uh, a lot of Let's Players will play my games and then retell my jokes and pretend they thought of those jokes. And then also be like, oh, this is disgusting. And they'll like start like vomiting on camera or something, you know, like um, stuff where it's like they're, they're kind of using me in my games as like a target. And when that happens, like does kind of like suck. Like I can't control who's downloading and playing and streaming my games. Um, so like after a while, like there's certain ways I like try to like kind of respond to that, to like try to design games that, that I don't know, weren't, weren't enabled were less enabling like like a like abusive behavior a little bit like that's that's one reason actually why um i'm actually kind of like feel uncertain about making about having games where um there's like people of color in it like a like take my spanking game there's a specific reason why that's like a white guy and not like like a black guy or a brown guy or like a person of color because I don't want to see a streamer like attacking a person of color's body and like laughing about it. It's still messed up to attack anyone's body and laugh about it, sure. Um, but it's also kind of like, what can you like, I don't like, I don't know, it's just super complicated and messy and annoying and um, I wish my I wish I could trust my audience more. I guess is the answer to that. But I've also learned that I can't really. So I kind of have to maintain the distance. Um, I'll move on from there because now because now I'm in like a heady drudging up all these memories. Uh, so I'll uh, talk a little bit about like sex and play in general now. So um, so who knows what this game is. This is this is a game called uh, the floor is hot lava, and uh, to play to play the floor is lava, all you have to do is when you're in a room, just shout the floor is lava, and people who want to start playing the floor is lava will start playing it with you. Um, you should try it in class. No, don't do it in class. I mean, maybe Colleen's class, but don't. Not known. 
not Anthony Dean's class. Is he still teaching there? He got really mad at me once. Uh, <laughs> I won't get into it. Um, now, this is a different game called Counter-Strike. Have people heard of Counter-Strike? Counter-Strike is a first-person multiplayer shooter where uh, counter-terrorist SWAT teams fight terrorists and shoot each other. They try to defuse bombs and rescue hostages and stuff. Um, it's, it's a little bit different from The Floor is Lava. Or is it so different? Because what if you played The Floor is Lava and Counter-Strike? Can you do that? Um, the answer is, I think, yes, you can play The Floor is Hot Lava and Counter-Strike. Uh, to play it, all you have to do is get your microphone, or you can play in Fortnite even too, uh, and just say, the floor is hot lava, and anyone in that Counter-Strike game <clears throat> who wants to play with you can do so. They just jump on the furniture. And uh, this is a key idea in a really great book called Metagaming. And uh, the quick summary of metagaming, so you can pretend to have read it, is um, the main idea of this book is Video games aren't games because you can always play a video game the wrong way. You can always play the floor's hot lava in Counter-Strike. You can always be a pacifist in like Counter-Strike or Fortnite, right? You can refuse to shoot people in Counter-Strike and actually people get really mad at you if you be a pacifist in it. Um, and their argument is that because you can play different games inside this video game, a video game is more like a platform that supports metagames. It's not, a video game is not a game because it contains games. So maybe that means it's not a game. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting, like, you can say that it's like a language game to play with, um, or you can try to like take the logic of it and be like, okay, maybe a video game is more like a platform that supports countless metagames. So to return to this idea, you can play the floor's hot lava inside any video game, basically. Can you play the floor is gay sex in Counter-Strike? Can you just start having gay sex in Counter-Strike? And I think the answer to that is actually yes. Um, it's a little bit more difficult than playing the floor's hot lava. I mean, gay sex always is a little bit more difficult, but um, it's worth it, you know, it's, it's, it's rewarding. And I think you can see this in a lot of games like, say, um, Street Fighter. Can you play gay sex in Street Fighter? Well, yes, you kind of can. Um, just say they're having gay sex and now they are, right? Having gay sex to exhaustion, to like literal exhaustion. Um, like, like one of my favorite stories about uh, Tale of Tales. Have you heard of Tale of Tales? Well, Colleen can tell you more about them. They're like this super interesting like couple who makes really interesting experimental video games. Um, and they, and I remember they were telling me this story about how they loved playing Tekken in, in their hotel room because they thought Tekken was just so, te Tekken's like a Street Fighter like video game. Um, they thought it was so sexual, just these bodies clashing and like hitting each other constantly. Um, oh yeah, and Aurea Harvey, yeah, used to uh, go to Parsons too, yeah. Um, and there's also ways that sex and games plays out in stuff like, um, like this is in a multi uh, uh, massively multiplayer RPG called Final Fantasy XIV. And in Final Fantasy XIV, you like go on quests and you like gain items and stuff. But and, I mean, yeah, you can play that Final Fantasy XIV. That one's okay. But I think the more interesting Final Fantasy XIV is the player run brothels in the player houses. You can buy your own house in Final Fantasy XIV and some players run brothels in there. Um, of course, that's not an official like a uh, game mechanic or whatever by Squaresoft or something, right? Um, this is something that players are inventing and performing within that, that game within the game. Um, or um, one form of, is this gonna, is this video gonna work? Let's see. 
do people see this video? So one other form of gaming within a game that I like is something called modding, where you can replace some stuff um, or swap in new mechanics or swap in new art and graphics. So this is a Sonic game, you know, Sonic's like Mario, where you're like platforming around the space, except now they've replaced Sonic with a penis. And that penis is just running through Italy at like 100 miles per hour. And who's to say that this is not gay sex? I don't know. This is kind of, this is certainly sexual. Um, this is certainly how some gay men experience Italy, I'm told. Um, I haven't had the pleasure. Um, but <laughs> I like that little bit where he's like confused. Like it's like a confused penis on a rooftop, just not sure what to do. Um, and then you lose all your rings, you lose all your cock rings. I don't know, it's just so interesting to like think of now, now to me, Sonic is just canonically a penis. Sonic is not a hedgehog to me at least. Um, Uh-oh, I think my slides are broken. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so that, that brings me to this idea of, of like, of sex as play and performance. Like, like you need to also think of sex as something beyond images. Sex goes beyond sexual images. I think sex is also something you do. It's like a performance with its own logic and logic is often invisible. Uh, so for instance, um, take uh, that those two images at the top there are uh, Texas Hold'em Poker. And you, you can learn to read the sex in poker, right? It's all these very serious men sitting around a table, staring each other down. It, I, I think it's a little bit sexual, at least a little bit. Um, but there's also a really nice consent mechanic built into poker, uh, where you decide whether you wanna go in on that hand or not. If you don't wanna play, you don't have to go in on any hands. Um, or if you decide that you don't like the way the cards are, are coming out for you, you can just fold in poker and stop playing that round, right? And that's actually like a really nice consent mechanic in some sense. Um, or take those two images down there. Uh, that's from a boxing video game called Fight Night. Um, and usually it's like a street fighter fighting game where it's like two boxers like hitting each other to death or whatever. But in between those rounds, this video game has a cut man mechanic uh, where you have to tend to your boxer. You have to like heal their wounds and stuff. And it's actually like very tender and intimate, I think, uh, in a way that is actually really inspiring to me, at least. Um, where, you know, you know, you're like caring for him a little bit and he's like responding to like your touch. I don't know, like, I think, um, I think Fight Night definitely like awakened one or two gay people, at least. I, I think it was, it was that piece of media for some people. So, but anyway, my point here is that these games don't seem sexual or, or gay or anything, but if you like step back and like think about their mechanics and their actions and how they're structured, um, you can see the sex in it and separate it if you want and steal it if you want. Um, so that's me talking about sex as play. Um, uh, any burning questions or thoughts before I move on? Is it making sense? Uh, have I lost anyone yet? No, all good. Okay, I'm going to like Zoom teacher mode too. Um, okay. So next uh, I'll talk about uh, sex and platforms and how I think sex intersects with technology. So um, this is a paper called Platformization in Game Development. And again, I'll try to summarize it so you can pretend to have read it. Uh, this paper is kind of about 
uh, tech platforms, you know, like Uber, Airbnb, Apple, uh, the Apple App Store, Steam, Google, Amazon. These are all like tech websites where we like do stuff and they, um, they control our access to each other. That's what a platform does. And we can also apply that thinking and critique to how games operate as platforms. So you might've heard of game engines like Unity or Unreal. Those are basically like Uber or Airbnb. They wanna make sure you cannot make a game without using Unreal. You cannot make a game without using Unity. They seek a monopoly and they may wanna make it impossible to make a game without them basically. Um, which is a little bit troubling when you apply that previous section about how game, all games are platforms, right? Video games aren't games, video games are platforms. So if we try to think more broadly about how games work, a game engine is software used to play a game, but what does playing mean? Um, in what ways is blank like a game engine? We could fill in a lot of things for that blank, right? In what ways is Steam a game engine? In what ways does do we want does Apple want to make sure you cannot run software on your iPhone without Apple saying yes, right? Or um, other software like like Discord and Slack, right? It's really hard to play a multiplayer game without going on Discord now. I feel like uh, to a certain extent. Um, but also like Slack is kind of like controlling like how games are developed now. But more broadly, we can also think of like Twitch or YouTube or TikTok. All these game developers I talk to, they're like, oh man, I gotta get on TikTok. I gotta get on TikTok. It's all happening. Like this is how everyone's finding about games and stuff. Like, like you cannot exist. Your game does not exist without making TikToks about it now. Um, there's literal ways this plays out where, for example, um, Valve um, on control Steam and they might ban things that they say aren't allowed on Steam anymore. Um, or let's say uh, Discord thinks that you shouldn't be able to be a furry on Discord. Um, or personally, a lot of my games that I've talked about, a lot of those games are banned specifically. Like if you go to the terms of service in Twitch, there's a list of specific banned games and you'll find a bunch of my games listed specifically like by a Twitch lawyer that like wrote my like rinse and repeat. Um, so I'm, I'm actually one of the most banned developers on Twitch, like specifically by name targeted. Um, Sometimes things change a little bit. Like fortunately, um, Steam was convinced a little bit to be a little bit more permissive than say like Instagram or something, but there's still this sense that like my existence on all these platforms is pretty precarious. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people feel that way about their relationship to technology now too. Um, this kind of extends even outside of gamer culture, right? Um, who knows what the TikTok algorithm is doing? Who knows what the Instagram algorithm is doing? Um, Tumblr, Tumblr just like makes me sad sometimes to think about. Um, but this also kind of has specific legal material consequences as well. Uh, we depend on these platforms to make a living, uh, to work, um, to like exist. Uh, so when a platform shuts out certain people who might rely on certain activity or um, certain practices, um, it kind of makes it impossible for these people to exist or to live, right? Um, so for example, sesta FOSTA is a law that um, basically kind of bans public sexuality um, uh, it kind of amounts to that, a public ban on sexuality, um, makes companies like liable for it kind of. Um, and that even affects people who feel like they might not be specifically targeted, right? So like queer adult comic artists, right? They're not, they're not full service sex workers, but they are sex work adjacent enough 
where they will get hit by this law as well. And that's kind of how a lot of these restrictive laws work, right? You might not be targeted in this round, but they will come for you next time. Don't worry. And broadly speaking, this is this all just worries me in general because I think banning sexuality is like banning art, is like banning love and history and culture. So much of human existence is about sex. Um, I mean, it's cool if sex does not drive your life. It's actually probably healthy if sex does not drive your life. Um, but for a lot of people, sex is also like an important, meaningful, positive part of their lives. Um, and I think if you ban it, that doesn't make sex healthier. That kind of actually pushes sex to be more like dangerous in a lot of ways. And I, and I wish we wouldn't do that. I wish we could be more open and healthy and social about it. So that's basically my talk. Uh, I talked about my games, talked about sex as play broadly, sex and platforms. Um, so to review how all this connects together, um, I make sex games, but I also think of sex as a performance medium. You can do any time, anywhere with consenting adults. Um, because video games are not games. Video games are platforms that enable interaction, like the Unreal Engine or TikTok or Tumblr. And as much as like social media might, might connect us as an engine, um, it often constrains us. And those rich people who own the social media platforms or Unreal Engine um, or Unity or Apple or whatever, they're, they, they're deciding what we're allowed to play. And that kind of, it's kind of sad. We don't have the freedom of play anymore, I feel like. When really it should just be none of their fucking business. I should, I should be able to be sexy on an iPhone without Tim Cook, a gay man, by the way, a, a traitor. Um, <laughs> just anyway, fuck all this. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to me, Ben. Um, hope you got something out of it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, oh my gosh. So I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. We're going to try to wrap up a little before uh, uh, 4 p.m. our time. What is that? 10 a.m. your time, Robert, um, on a different day. Um, but thank you so much. This was uh, incredible incredibly inspiring. I love the way you structured the talk in three parts where you're talking about your practice as an example, then sex and games, and then also the political and capitalist implications of survival uh, in platform under platform capitalism. So I have three questions and you can choose to answer one, two, or three. Uh, all right, here we go. Um, I'm going to ask a question that is related to your creative practice. A student asked me last week, how do you get ideas for games? So that's question one. I can write these down for you. The second question is, how is it possible to survive <laughs> as an indie game maker, as an artist uh, making games under these conditions? It seems like it must be incredibly difficult. And I think for students who are thinking about their futures, do you have advice for them uh, about survival? Um, and then uh, let's just go with those two because I want to open it to uh, other questions too. So please type your questions in to the chat. We'll just go with those two. Survival under platform cap capitalism. How do you do it? How, can anyone else do it? And uh, how do you get ideas for your games? Cool. Okay. Uh, okay. So, oh, okay. Where do I get ideas for my games? Um, I think part of it is that I'm like just terminally online. And then whenever I see something like perverted or like stupid, I'm like, oh, can I like make a game about that? Um, like half of my game concepts are just from like, oh, like it would be funny if I made a game about that. And then I make the game and then it takes me like months and then it's not funny anymore to me, um, but at least it'll be funny to uh, someone. Um, but as an, as an artist more generally, 
I think that just amounts to like walking around and like point at something and be like, can I make a game about this? Can I make art about this? Oh, you can't see it. Um, can I make, um, you know, like what, what does this thing mean to me? You know, like um, it, it, it amounts to like observation and just questioning, I think. Um, and then the second question was, uh, oh, how to survive. survival. <laughs> um, right now I'm doing, well, first I moved out of New York, uh, <laughs> um, which is, it's, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, second, although I miss a lot of things about New York, I'll talk about that later. Um, second, um, I, ha I do have a day job. I, I do like game development, contracting for like other people's commercial games. Um, so that's that might be something you probably do, do while you're at school or after school, um, a day job, uh, which is fine. There's I, I don't think there's any shame in that. I, actually, I kind of like it, I think, because it kind of lets me separate what I do for money versus what I do for myself. And sometimes that's nice. Um, and then how else do I survive? Um, oh, and then, oh, do you want bad advice for surviving? <laughs> um, sure, I think students would be bad, open to bad advice. Bad advice for surviving is to get married and then collect tax breaks and pool your both of your incomes together into one household. Um, nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Robert. Th those are great. And and I think a lot of times, like we need to de demystify these things, right? And be uh, open about how one lives in these conditions. Um, cool. So Roy, uh, Roy has a question here. I can read it out if you want, or, or Roy, if you want. You can. Uh, it's in the chat. I'm wondering if there's any anthropological approach analysis you'd like to share when designing those games reflecting a part of the gay community, like the different behaviors, reactions, and mindsets on different social media and different places in real life. So I'm still okay. I'm unpacking that question. Um, let's see. I have some. Let's see, so how do my games, how do I like approach reflecting the gay community um, or part of the gay community uh, in different social media? Um, so how do I think about the odd, like how do I approach my audience, the part of my audience that I don't hate? Um, let's see. Um, I, Let's see. Oh God. I like usually like a lot of my games kind of zero in on like kind of like specific like fetishes sometimes, right? Like my like my rinse and like rinse and repeat is kind of like a shower porn game a little bit. And me trying to unpack like the anxiety behind shower porn, right? Like on one hand, there's also kind of like like a like a uh, like a gay anxiety about being in the locker room, but it's also kind of like a sexy fantasy, but it's also like scary if you're in the wrong locker room. So it's like, um, yeah, I think some of it is like me letting my neuroses hang out a little bit and then hoping like other people identify with it, maybe. Um, I wouldn't say it's, I'm method, I'm methodological in my um, like approach. Um, I'm, I'm pretty like intuitive, I think as a maker, I'm kind of just like massaging this code and then playing it and then seeing if it like feels right or, if, oh, does that look right? No, I'll like do this now. Um, I think if, if you're one of those like scientific artists, that's kind of, that's cool and you do you, but I think I've discovered that I'm not maybe one of those. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think we have Simon. Hi, can you hear me fine? All right, yep. um, big fan, 
followed you on Twitter for ages. I'm actually um, pretty familiar with your level design work. I watched your whole series on the Black Mesa level design that you streamed like ages ago. Um, and I noticed that you you compartmentalize your level design work with Quake or the Source Engine and your um, your like gay games. And I wondered if there was like, you know, if you've, is it because you haven't like found a way to fuse the two or is it kind of like hard to do that sort of thing? I mean, like there, it's not like you can do much like with like sexual content in the Source Engine unless it's like Source Filmmaker for it or something like that. But like, I was just wondering if there was some um, a plan or um you know instance to to kind of put those two like interests together because i i like when people like take their like very obscure interests and kind of like meet them in the middle yeah i have there's there's maybe like a there's like a five or ten year plan in place i don't know um uh i think part of it is that they're just two different audiences kind of and I, I would just even run into this like on like Twitter. I mean, back when people were using Twitter or something where, you know, like, yeah, some people like it when I like do gay shit posting. And then some people like it when I like share like unity tips or something. So uh, th those, those te did tend to be like kind of like two different audiences. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is that it's kind of, um, the, the, the industry thinks of those as two different things. Like if you, if you go to GDC, a uh, game developer conference, uh, for everyone, um, th there's no gay architecture, like conference track, right? There's, there's a level design section. And then there's like a interesting people section ghetto where they push everyone off to the side. So, um, the industry also kind of like makes me like specialize and like bifurcate into like two different Robert Yangs. Um, um, there, there, I don't know, there's also like a professional side. I can find work as a level designer pretty easily. It's harder to find work as like a gay sex designer. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like, I blame other people. <laughs> I think that's a very fair thing to just blame for most things. It's other people. Thank you. You know, on my way into school today, I was listening to a podcast um, where you were talking about uh, showing Radiator, I think it was, your gay divorce game built in the Half-Life uh, as a mod for Half-Life, which, which also I think is a really fascinating part of your early career um and I, you were you were relating that you were meeting with i forget who it was at, at valve uh for your dream job right and they and you showed them this beautiful game which i knew about before i met you and um they were like uh this is great but you're not gonna be able to do this at valve um and so i also wonder if maybe that early trauma <laughs> Uh, experience. I mean, you're you're doing quite well, uh, obviously, without that job. But um, you know, a lesson for us all to to think about our creative practice and our professional work and the work that we do uh, in ways that can be multiple. <laughs> yeah, that was um, yeah, that was that was Robin Walker, uh, oh. inventor of Team Fortress and Team Fortress Two. Um, so like a very like senior Valve person who was very kind to take the time to like talk to like a student who was making these weird little gay sex things with his technology. Um, and yeah, yeah, I was, I was trying to do my, I was trying to get a dream job at the company back, back when Valve made games. It was like my dream job. And then um, I, 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 at the time I, I was really upset, right, um, where I was, I felt like this is like this random tech dad telling me that I'm useless, um, which I don't know, maybe he was. But I think now when I look back on it, I'm like, oh, like, no, he was right. I would not have been happy working there if by some weird twist that I had been hired or did work there. Um, it wouldn't have 
been good. So like sometimes, sometimes a rejection isn't so bad in the long run. I mean, it sucks and it's annoying, but um, artist career wise, I think, yeah, I, I am happier that I did not take that forking path. I took a different forking path in my life. Um, yeah, I, I can say one. that I'm happy that you didn't either. You decided to go to art school um, and I got to meet you and that we all get to play the incredible, incredible games uh, that you make. It's an inspiration for everybody. Um, and you can find your games on, on itch.io, which is perhaps a platform that isn't as restrictive uh, and hopefully won't be for a while. And is supportive. Awesome. Other questions? Any any last quick question from anybody here? All right. Well, the class bell is going to ring for uh, 4 p.m. classes. And and Robert, you got to get your day started. But I really, really appreciate you taking the time today. Um, I hope we get to see you in person. I, I miss you. Uh, the program misses you. Um, yeah, I miss so all please. you too. Come on by. Yeah. <laughs> someday. Someday. Yes, please. Awesome. Oh, hi, John. Bye, John. Um, were you <laughs> saying that you were going to go to GDC or something this year? I um, oh, like yeah, I yeah. I'll be I'll be at GDC. Um, that's kind of like half when, the work. Stuff. When is that again? I always forget. Oh, uh, I think it's like late March. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not doing a talk there. It's it's kind of stressful to do talks. Not this talk, but like big, big like grown up. Yeah, big expensive talks that people like paid to see. I mean, I guess one in a sense. <laughs> um, oh hi, Eston. Um, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it's like the last week of March. So yeah, if any of you around GDC, maybe see y'all around. But there's literally no reason. I wouldn't recommend going to GDC. I'm, I'm going because I kind of have to. You shouldn't go. And say, I don't like San Francisco that much. Sorry, this talk is just stretching on for a while. That's a different talk. <laughs> well, stop. I wish I was going this year. It's like the first year I'm not going in a decade and I'm going to miss seeing you. So darn. <laughs> Seems like some people will be there though. So hopefully y'all can connect. Thank you again, Robert. Yay. Thanks again. Right. Have a good uh, semester, everyone.